Now you're looking good, right, Robert? Yes, now, now that's, that's working. Thank you. Okay, so as, uh, as, as Gordon mentioned, we have four different sessions, uh, introductions and vis fundamentals, scientific storytelling, visualization tools anyone can use, and more tools, contributing topics, and discussion. Now, I wanna thank all of those who completed the pre-survey because this calendar, this the schedule is based upon what you said you wanted most. So we emphasize those things. There are some things we're gonna talk about no matter what, um, but we emphasize uh, what, what you're looking for, okay? So our first session um, is gonna have Ryan White with Viz 101, Robert Hurt with Color, and Kim Arcand who will have uh, an accessible universe. Robert, did you wanna say anything to the audience? Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to welcome everybody and first of all, express how sad I am. I'm not there in person. Uh, sometimes back issues override things like actually being there to network, but I hope that everyone else will take the opportunity to introduce yourselves to one another and get to know each other because one of the, the real virtues of having these in-person sessions is getting a chance to understand who else is interested in Viz and you know, know who to circle back to and contact in the future. So. Uh, I think we're going to be covering a lot of topics today and far more than any one person will ever be able to pursue in their, uh, their, their research or their visualization career. But understand that part of the reason that we do this is so that if even if you're not going to be a like a viz practitioner yourself, just understanding the process of how visualizations are done and how different kinds of software, different kinds of tools exist for different purposes, I think is of utility because it means you'll be better armed if you say have a press release that suddenly you're trying to help develop in six months. Uh, if, if you can speak the language a little more, if you understand the limits, I think this might uh, enhance your ability to do it. And who knows, there may be one or two things you see here that really get your interest and make you want to dive in deeper. So uh, uh, think of this as sort of a smorgasbord as what's out there. Don't think that, of course, everyone has to be an expert in all of it. You know, this is just a, this is just trying to uh, tee it up and, and give us an awesome uh, starting point to kind of look at this, uh, this field. And... Um, this is just one workshop, but uh, note that we are going to continue uh, over the coming years uh, uh, to try to facilitate keeping communications going between people interested in visualization. So we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, but uh, get to know right. each other and say hi. And Robert, I will note that I recognize only a few of the people. I recognize the speakers and a few other people in this room, and I love it that I don't recognize because when we do these astrophys workshops, it's amongst the specialists and such. And to see uh, so many faces I don't recognize, this is what we really wanted to do, to, to bring the visualization that we do as our profession out to you guys and see uh, how much we can uh, encourage you to put more of it into you what you do. All right. So with that, uh, let's go to Ryan Wyatt's first talk. Uh, Ryan, you're up. You have 15 minutes. Hold on a second. I have to start the screen share, and it's not letting me do what I normally do on my thing. So I have to. <sighs> All right. I do this every month for the public lecture series, and I start the screen share after I start the PowerPoint. But no, not today. I'm going to switch it up on me. All right. And it's going to do that little funky thing for me again. Ladies and gentlemen, Ryan Wyatt. Well, thank you, Frank, and thank you for the tech support because I'm glad I wasn't in the position <laughs> of having to move windows around um, on the desktop. So um, my name is Ryan Wyatt. I'm the Senior Director of Morrison Planetarium and Science Visualization at the California Academy of Sciences. Uh, and my role in this is to sort of queue up some of the ideas around sort of what we mean by visualization, some examples of uh, visualization visualization uh, and some of the ideas that will be fleshed out as we kind of go through the rest of the day. This um, is a version of a talk that I've given quite a bit and actually it originated when I worked in my previous job uh, at the American Museum of Natural History. So opposite side of the country, but doing some similar kind of work. And um, actually Carter Emmert is in the room uh, who was right behind me, although I didn't realize it earlier. And uh, Carter and I had a chance to work together. And when, when we were in the process of putting together this role, um, we talked a lot about what I would be doing, but we didn't actually talk about what my 
position title would be. And, and, and it wasn't until the last minute that I kind of got the offer letter and the title was Science Visualizer, which made me wonder exactly what I would be doing. I kind of imagined sitting in an office with like incense burning and sort of visualizing <laughs> science like one might visualize world peace, which actually is a lot like Carter's office <laughs> if, uh, if you're ever in New York. And so then I, I basically wanted to make that comment in a presentation and I, I, I Googled and this is recreated using um, uh, Creative Commons and, uh, and public domain imagery, but uh, this sort of idea that, uh, that it's kind of like, um, you know, visualizing science, the Google search came up with this, uh, this image of Ganesh uh, in front of the Pleiades and um, in a way that only a Google, Google search can kind of originate. Well, I guess now we have uh, AI, AI may be able to generate even crazier images. I want to see what the AI generates at that. Point. I should. <laughs> all right. So during a break, um, and and I realized actually that there is there is some relevance to this because I look at this image of again actually I recognize um, some aspects of it, but there's symbolism and there's content in this image that I don't understand because I'm not familiar with the iconography, and and I realize that that's a good example of of how often mistakes happen in the way we present visualizations to broad audiences, because sometimes we embed visual language that's not familiar to our audiences. So I'll circle back to that point, but I wanna just address the fundamental issue, which is that visualization is about taking contemporary scientific data, which is all ones and zeros, and trying to make sense of that, because we can't look at raw data in the most literal sense and understand it. This process of visualization is a way to understand data for research, to communicate data to peers, and also to share data and knowledge with broad audiences. So those ones and zeros may take the form of um, photons that are being collected by telescopes and this famous image from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope of what's been nicknamed the Pillars of Creation. This is a subjective process because you have to take that data and create an image in ways that might be discussed at various points during today's talks. But fundamentally, this is an interpretation of the data. Uh, and in this case, data that we're collecting uh, from a telescope. But those data may also come from computational simulations. So uh, this, for uh, example, is a, a sequence that we rendered for our show, uh, Life, a Cosmic Story, about the origin of the solar system. Uh, and we're uh, using um, a computational simulation of uh, the solar system formation in the context of a, of a show that I'll, that I'll describe actually in my, my second talk today. But uh, this is, for lack of a better term, kind of a, a photoreal-ish representation of this computational data for a public audience. But really any graph or very familiar, potentially very familiar sort of chart is a visualization. And some of the things that we'll talk about today will be ways to help think about how these are images that can be presented, not just to uh, ourselves and our, our peers, but also to broader audiences. So I feel pretty confident that in asking this room, if I ask you what red represents, or actually just generally what color represents in, in this image, how would you answer that? Number density, yes. So red is the peak number density. They helpfully provide a little um, legend in the lower left corner, but they actually don't tell you what it is. Um, so although this is a rather old image, I like using it because it is this kind of encoding that is for people conversant in, in scientific images is familiar enough to be able to read it. And of course, if you uh, are an astronomer, Hertzsprung Russell diagram is sort of uh, uh, a, the, a very basic and fundamental way that we have of talking about uh, the, about stars. So uh, this is a very familiar kind of context. But uh, having given this presentation to college students, to people working in the tech industry, to various people interested in visualization, um, not everybody gets that answer right or knows what that meaning is. So. Uh, I'll come back to this again, but it's, it's, a, it's a word of caution when we present our visualizations to, to broad audiences. Um, a 
kind of extending this to things that are maybe on the fringe or maybe not quite what we're talking about when we talk about visualization. There are more diagrammatic representations uh, that we, um, thank you, that we uh, may or that sort of are, are kind of in this realm from like uh, visualization into like infographics and, and such. Um, and even this example, which is sort of a nice kind of infographic -y kind of cartoon of um, of planetary formation. So all of these examples, I've tried to use like star and planet formation as, as kind of a theme. But one of the things that I think is interesting about this representation is that um, it is more of a cartoon, but one of the things that it leverages is a sequential art kind of context that's very familiar across cultures because comics and sequential art are something that many cultures use. And so it's a, it's a way of presenting information that actually is, is familiar to a lot of people. So the core kind of concept I wanna sort of, if there's one thing to take away from uh, this presentation is to really think about audiences for your visualization. And whether that's a visualization that you're downloading and gonna incorporate in a presentation for the public or a visualization that you're gonna share at a conference to think about who the audience for your visualization is. And I've kind of separated this into three categories. And one is it's for yourself. It's a data analysis visualization. It's a way of presenting the data to take those ones and zeros and represent it to yourself so that you can make sense of it. Uh, maybe it's communication to peers. So choosing kind of common representations that will be understandable to an expert audience. But then also, and where sort of my day-to-day -day focus is, is on creating visualizations for broader publics, for people who are consuming these in the context of, as you might guess from my title, a planetarium show, or from a museum exhibit, or from an online uh, video or article. And I think that, as I kind of hinted at earlier, the mistake that often happens, or the where, where visualization can often fail for broad audiences, is that um, in that continuum from peers to non-experts, we often use encodings, so kind of like that color coding of number density for the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram that I showed you, we use encodings that will be familiar to expert audiences, but not to general audiences. So that's sort of the, the, the warning that I'd like you to take from this, but to kind of go through each of these, I just like this Claude Shannon quote, um, because sort of the originator of information theory, um, talking about how he sees himself uh, or saw himself as, as, as more, um, more visual than symbolic. And I think that really fundamentally as, as, as human beings, for the most part, we are very visual creatures. And so being able to use visualization as a tool for analyzing and understanding data, uh, visualization is powerful sort of uh, uh, classic example of uh, statistical data that uh, may look superficially the same. If you look at the, uh, at the, at the, at the, the numbers that would describe uh, these various data sets. Uh, and yet, if you plot them, you immediately see that, that statistical um, representation doesn't necessarily give you uh, a sense of, of what, um, of what is very clear from a, an, an immediate visual, rep, uh, visual representation. And again, really, this is fundamentally about taking the, those complicated ones and zeros of, uh, of all of the data that we have to deal with, understand, and communicate, and being able to create something that is understandable and beautiful and communicates what we want. And just as a kind of circle back to this image that I mentioned earlier, then is that is that that danger of using encodings that are familiar to an expert audience to communicate ideas to broader audiences either has to then be scaffolded with a lot of description and explanation so that people can understand what they're seeing, or you need to think about your encoding to be able to uh, make it more generally accessible to audiences. Otherwise, people will just sort of look at this and think, sciencey stuff the same way you'd look at this and think new agey something. Yeah. So, um, so again, 
trying to be very aware of those encodings. And when you do leverage encodings, and just want to give a couple examples, um, there are very familiar encodings like that, that, that comic strip sequential art I mentioned. Um, maps are another one. So to, to present an example from one of our great science visualizers, uh, Randall Monroe, um, this is a, an image of uh, all of the surface area of sort of solid bodies in the solar system. And to give you a sense of the relative scale of these different objects, and you can see Venus and Mars and, and other objects in the solar system, he borrows the iconography and language of a map. He even tinted this, that kind of antique color on the, on the website to reinforce this idea of a, of a map. And so he's leveraging that. And it makes sense because this is a map. It is a, a geographic, oh, well, solar system graphic representation of these, of these surface areas. And so he's leveraging the, the, the kind of cultural vernacular of the map image to be able to present this in a way that's, that's understandable. But to just give an example of one that I think fails and I won't name the artist here, but someone else, someone even, they did a better job even. They borrowed all of the National Geographic color scheme all of the isocontours and things like that to give you this sense of a map, but it's really just an image of the brain and it doesn't have anything to do with an actual map. And so it's leveraging this, um, this iconography in a way that's not meaningful in helping people interpret um, the data. So I wanna wrap this up with just a couple examples of what I think are good references if you do wanna explore more about visualization. And this is focused more on being able to create uh, data representations for your own use or for your peer group. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Noah Alinsky's data visualization is a phenomenal reference. It's super small. Don't ever buy the paper version because it's printed in black and white, but it has color illustrations. So buy the digital version if you want. Um, but it kind of represents a very straightforward recipe and helps you think about what he calls the four pillars of, very, of visualization, which, help, which helps you kind of think about what you're trying to accomplish with the visualization it's almost like a recipe book for thinking through how to visualize particularly data for scientific papers or for, again, for representing uh, data to your peers. And he also talks about visual encodings, uh, which is something that will sort of come up in the, um, in the course of this, which is basically uh, of today's talks, which is basically the, the fundamental ways that we interpret visuals, um, visual representations and too much to go into, but it's a good way of kind of, a, again, a sort of recipe book to think about how you choose to represent your data. And then just a couple more, um, again, books uh, that I think are, are helpful. Uh, Colin Ware's Visual Thinking uh, for Design. He has a big thick book. This is the thin one. This is a great reference uh, to help you think about uh, visual representations. And then two of Nathan Yao's books, uh, Data Points, which is a good sort of general introduction. And then Visualize This, which actually goes into more kind of uh, nitty gritty details and, uh, and actual examples of code, et cetera. I went through those very quickly, but I will just note that um, on, I have a resources tab on my Visualizing Science page, which is the URL that I'll pre present here, Visualizing Science at Rewind, and I list all of those. So if you just want to go to that, you can nab um, the references to all those books. So I'm hoping right. I'm under my 15 minutes. Yeah. All right. So thank you very much. Eight hundred questions. One minute question. Who's got a question for Ryan? Yes. Oh, awesome. I'm going to ask a question that Ryan says. Okay. So, in one of these books, you make a point, you visualize this, that even though he's a big expert, you make what you see him make take seven different places. He always like, fixes it up before you touch it. So, do you have any advice for people about <laughs> one, two, three? The ball or not. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's going to run throughout this entire. Right. This. There is no one tool to rule out. Go. <laughs> well, should I just answer glue? Um, but um, <laughs> oh, that's sucking up. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I mean I, I, it's a really great point because I think that uh, and and you know it's it, there's there is um, there's a range of aesthetics that that that. Um, and it was the last bullet point in the, in those four pillars, by the way. Excuse me, but the um, to to really get this refined sort of aesthetics, often you're going through a lot more uh, hoops. So um, I think we'll have a great conversation about tools. But yeah, I think it's 
it's virtually impossible to create that really refined um, final product without going through uh, uh, using a, a variety of tools. So, yeah. All right, thank Great. you. All right, thank you, Ryan. Uh, our next presenter uh, is Robert Hurt and is online and I need to stop my share. Why is my share thing over on that screen? All right, I'm gonna get out of this. Stopping the share. Okay, Robert, have you shared your screen? You look like yes, you have. Yes, I have shared. Are you seeing that? All right. All right, okay. Gordon, start the timer. Robert, take it Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to slice in. Ryan's given such a wonderful overview. I'm going to hone in on one very specific idea in visualization, and that is use of color in how we visualize our data. And if you have but one takeaway from this talk, it is enough with the bleeping rainbow already. Uh, I, I say that whimsically, but it also becomes a kind of interesting culture study of one particular habit in, in science visualization, why we ended up, why it exists, why we can't get rid of it, and why it's so bad. And it's kind of a thing, I think it's a great case study to, to, to focus us on trying to be more conscious of uh, making our visualizations accessible and meaningful. So let me just start by saying, when we are thinking about how we use color to visualize, uh, to colorize our data, there are two kinds of data types that we generally end up working with, uh, ordered and categorical. Now, now, the second categorical is very straightforward. That's when you just have different bins that you're just lining up in a histogram or, or choosing uh, data points to represent, uh, apples, oranges, quasars, seaforts. Um, whereas ordered data sets are just, you know, basically XY plots where you're plotting intensity as a function of some other parameter. Uh, now, sequential data sets actually can, or ordered data sets actually have two different types. There's sequential data, which is effectively just, there's some variation over uh, some uh, parameter that you're mapping or diverging, which is, it's the same thing, but there, instead of thinking of it just as an intensity variation over uh, a parameter, it's a fluctuation about an average value. Fundamentally, they're still basically the same thing, but it's a slightly different way of looking at uh, uh, either increasing intensity or fluctuations about a mean. And we'll uh, dig into that a little bit. Now, I I'm actually going to go to some uh, uh, elevation data here because I've given this talk to JPL and they have a lot of uh, earth science people that I, I was trying to reach, but you know, same deal with uh, uh, grayscale astronomy data. Uh, the, the, the canonical version of a sequential data set is an intensity image. And, um, you know, the, the basic way of representing that is a grayscale uh, plot. And, and that actually works. It's very effective. But, you know, we sometimes want our stuff to look better and, uh, and carry a little more visual impact. So we find ways of colorizing it. And historically, astronomy has been burdened with this manner, the, uh, the, the rainbow palette. And I want to now start deconstructing that palette for you on why it is a terrible choice when there are so many other ways you can go about visualizing that data with color. So what's wrong with it? Well, nearly everything. And so let me try to enumerate some of these. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, when you are applying color to help interpret intensity changes, things that have a, a natural ordering, Spectral ordering is not intuitive. If I put these swatches out and ask you to order them from uh, low intensity to high intensity, or you know, high to low, left to right, right, there's a lot of cognitive load you're going to take on trying to mentally try to sort these out. It is intuitive. Whereas, you know, if it was grayscale, you would get it like that. You can clearly go from dark to light. So just ordering by hue hides that natural order. It makes it harder to understand what you're trying to get to. Another significant problem with it, which is really obvious, is that simply it obscures detail. You look at these two color palettes applied to the same uh, grayscale image, and obviously the rainbow palette, it, it, you don't see nearly the fidelity, the subtlety in the image that you get in the grayscale or in this uh, heat palette. What's more, the color ramp there creates arbitrary boundaries. Region, it regionizes things based on completely arbitrary divisions that happen to be where you are falling in the gaps between one part of the hue spectrum into the other. And that's especially true with yellow, which stands out as so bright. Uh, it, um, this is a, a, a way of, frag it fragments your understanding of the data instead of making it look like the continuum that it really represents. 
But maybe the most motivating uh, reason to abandon the color of the rainbow palette forever is its inaccessibility to, inaccessibility to colorblind viewers. Because if you actually apply a uh, preview to what these different palettes look like, you'll see that the rainbow becomes a complete mush to uh, uh, red green blindness. And likewise, for full color blindness, if you convert to grayscale, it actually randomizes the data because the varying intensity that we see, the, the, the changing brightness value as a function of hue just goes up and down, up and down. And so it kind of chops up the sense of progression through the data set where other palettes that use brightness in addition to color to key for it become maintain their interpretability, even if they get converted to a grayscale, which isn't just for colorblindness, right? This could also be if your document happens to get printed on a black and white laser printer and you know it, 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 you might lose the meaning of it. But what about the science culture of the rainbow palettes? Why are they so common? Well, frankly, the reason is fundamentally traceable to the fact they were just easy to code over 30 years ago in software, because it was just a simple linear sawtooth that was applied to the red, green, and blue channels. As such, it was always implemented in software, often as default option. And then science cultural inertia kind of kicks in where, well, that's the way real science was done. So you, you, you go to that because that's the way that you, your, your advisor and your grand advisor did their data plots. But today it gets perpetuated partly because of an ignorance of the accessibility issues. So, uh, one of the perceptual reasons this creates such artifacts is that to create the secondary colors, magenta, cyan, and yellow, you actually have to turn on both your blue and your red pixels. And so you know that a screen will look brighter when you have more things lit up than fewer things lit up. It creates this artificial bright down, bright dark, bright dark that it, it kind of mangles the data set. So I can actually say for some reason, if you desperately need to use a rainbow for some, some justifiable purpose, don't use the classic rainbow. Use something that has been dubbed a signbow instead, where you can replace the sawtooth with a sinusoidal variation, which at least gives you this option of when you are doing these crossover colors, the yellows, the magentas, the cyans, you're actually not at peak brightness on the phosphors, the pixels at those point. And so it evens out the uh, brightness variation and gives you a more consistent hue variation. It also actually will bring out, uh, recover a little bit of the lost detail that you get with the classic rainbow. But seriously, there are so many other good options to choose from for both sequential and diverging color palettes. There's no really reason not to go just a quick Google search away or just searching defaults in whatever software you're using. But a common feature of good color palettes for uh, colorizing the sequential data is that intensity becomes correlated not only to hue, but also to brightness. So you have a fallback. It, it makes it just much more intuitive to see, to understand what you're looking at. Now to switch to an astronomy uh, uh, history here, you know, uh, I think probably one of our most egregious uh, historical episodes of, of uh, uh, color, rainbow color ramps is in cosmic microwave background maps. We're all used to these old maps from Kobe, from WMAP. They were all done with these rainbow stretches and they all have, they all create these, these difficult to interpret things, these red spots that pop out with a significance way in excess of their importance in the data. Uh, to their credit, the Planck team really recognized this, and they uh, developed a, a, a really well thought through uh, diverging palette to apply to the Planck data that keeps very neutral tonality at the midpoint in the variations and equal weight in the offsets to the red and the blue. Uh, but I would argue that sometimes you might even want to ask yourself if you are really focused on this being a diverging palette, are you sure you might not be able to represent it just as a simple sequential palette? Because in fact, these fluctuations in brightness are really slightly brighter and dimmer regions of the sky. I would argue that you may oh, actually, yeah. thank you, uh, confuse people less by even not using the diverging palette, but using a sequential palette for something like this. Uh, I would pose another question. Uh, I, I just said how wonderful that diverging palette is. What's wrong with the way the Planck team used this when they were releasing an image of, um, of magnetic streamlines, which is actually a very good way of uh, uh, revealing polarization in the data sets. That's because they used a diverging palette for a data set that was intrinsically a sequential data set. They've created this artificial duality of somehow the blue regions of the sky and the red regions of the sky because of that diverging palette 
which looks really cool. But in fact, if you strip that away and render it with the proper uh, a sequential palette, you see it creates this complete sense of uh, a division where there is none in the data. So um, just quick through a few ideas. I'll have some links here at the end that you can check. But uh, uh, for categorical schemes, it's the same deal. You really want to think very carefully about choosing colors that will not break down for color blindness uh, uh, accessibility. And there are many tools out there that you can use to test this. There's a plugin that you can drop in your laptop called Color Oracle that will let you do quick instant previews. There are online palettes for generating colorblind friendly uh, uh, ordered uh, uh, data sets. Uh, there's a fantastic site at Adobe that really explains uh, the different use of color and types of uh, color palettes for different purposes. I, uh, it's, a, it's a great tutorial on just basic data visual 101 on color. And uh, I'll just throw this up. It has the links to these various uh, resources you can go to if you want to take a, a quick photo of that and uh, track these down on your own. Uh, the first one, the Dear NASA blog, is still my go-to to try to convince colleagues to never, ever use a rainbow again. So. Uh, that wraps it up for me. Thank you, Robert. And Robert, may I ask you when you have a break to, to post some, I know we'll make the slides available, but we're also trying to capture some of these resources in the Slack channel. So Robert, uh, could you drop some of those in there or a screen cap? Yes, or yes, I will, I'll, I'll copy paste these into the uh, Let's Slack Let's take channels. one minute for questions uh, here in the audience. Right. Uh, got a question for Robert? Yeah. Hi, Robert. Uh, thank you for the talk. It was great. Um, you know, something that I was asking is that in my own work, um, I definitely like got like it was more like a problem like a few years ago, but like with like professors and stuff, they're like very used to just like like rainbow car maps. And I think part of the reason that they kind of like advocated for this is that it kind of like artificially gives you like a sort of like it artificially like, takes like the sequential data and something that fits like car format. Do you think that? Like data like that is necessarily best represented as like a gradient spectrum in gradient, or do you think there's like a place for like having those sort of like talk about that they can take this? It's kind of what I think the rainbow car is really kind of. So I got to admit, I, I, I was tantalizing and close to understanding that, but I missed about a third of what you said. Is there a very quick way? Could someone summarize that quickly into the mic? Or in fact, right. if you're he's, um, he's, he's saying that. Um, uh, a lot of the older professors, the, the has-beens, you know, people like me, um, <laughs> advocate for the rainbow color map because it sort of creates a contour map. Um, and so he was wondering if, it, you know, yeah, got it, got they, it. Yes, they see the contour map idea. The, uh, so there are a couple of things about the contour map, and part of it has to do back to what Ryan said on audiences. What are you, who are you making this for? And if you are actually creating something that you are designing as a tool to literally read numbers off of. Uh, and that is an actual use case of that image, then you can make an argument that you need colors that you can read things off. Like for instance, a temperature map that uh, uh, you, know, you wanna see, is it gonna be 70 degrees or 80 degrees where I am? But you will, I think if you look at it in most cases, you're not gonna do science by reading a number off of a color image. You're gonna actually go to the data set and read the number. And if you're trying to just get across the relative sense of intensities, that that contouring is actually going to have so many other negative aspects associated with it. That said, if contouring is critically important for that use case, there are other palettes that actually have like brightness variations kind of baked into them that build in much more concrete contours that actually achieve that more effectively than just the uh, the classic rainbow palette. So there are in fact contour palettes that can be used for that, but there are ones that can be Created, they're done in a way that are also colorblind accessible. Okay, can you stop your screen share? I can. Thank you. All right, our next speaker uh, is, um, oh, let's see, I have to start the screen share first, right? Okay. Okay, our next speaker is not here, and she was going to do this virtually, but then she got tagged to do something else today, so she recorded it for us, uh, Kim Arcan from Chandra X-Ray Observatory, and I will let her introduce herself. Hello, everybody. I'm Kim Arcan, and I'm going to be talking today about our accessible universe through sight, sound, and touch. 
So I work for NASA's Chandra Observatory, which is operated for the Center for Astrophysics um, for NASA. And I've been there for about 23, 24 years. And I spent most of my career working on these digital assets from the telescope, which goes about a third of the way to the moon. And you can see- Is there a way we can get the volume higher, Gordon? I, I've got my, my computer's maxed out. Oh, no, it's volume. Let's try playing it again. Yeah. See on my slide here, I have the very first image that we ever released there from Chandra called Cassiopeia A. It's a beautiful supernova remnant. But those first years of working on these digital assets, I was really concentrated on the visual. And it came to me, you know, about 10 years ago that I really needed to do some work to think beyond just prioritizing the human sense of sight. So that brought me to work with some collaborators who had been taking this data of Cassiopeia A, this beautiful supernova remnant, and plotting it into 3D. And from there, I actually worked with the Smithsonian 3D office to be able to take that and learn how to 3D print it. And that sort of procedure, that process, that journey just really opened up my eyes to a new way of being able to both understand and also present scientific data in new ways that don't just prioritize sight. So after that first model, that first 3D printable object of NASA data, it was really important for me to be able to find more data and then to be able to work with people in the community of people who are blind or low vision to be able to figure out how this 3D printing could be optimized for them. And there are a number of sort of parameters on the size, the resolution, the quality, the access points, the quantity, and sort of that universal design aspect that became really important to making those 3D models more usable, more accessible, and have better meaning making for people who are either blind or low vision. We have a paper on all of the details. So if you're into 3D printing, please feel free to uh, grab a copy of this slide, or I can for sure share the paper and talk about that with you in more detail. But essentially, we found that overall, these 3D models were really, really helpful. And it just helped address that issue of equity and accessibility um, in this idea of being able to share knowledge of our universe. We created 3D printable kits of various objects that were stars or various stages of stellar evolution and worked with a number of different community members to make sure we really pilot tested them and formative tested them very, very well. Um, working with a number of groups such as the International Astronomical Union, various NASA centers, and groups of um, either blind or low vision people. And we were really, really happy with that project, but then the pandemic hit and we just sort of realized we needed to pivot. So one of the ways we were really working on pivoting was sticking in a digital space. And we've worked again with the uh, 3D office at the Smithsonian to be able to really get some extra bang for the buck out of our 3D models. Uh, we worked with them to incorporate them into their 3D Voyager library. And so they're operable in augmented reality as well. But then we also started concentrating on this idea of sonifying the data as well or translating that image information into sound. So data sonification is a real growing area of research for astronomy, um, both on the research side, but also on the discovery side and communication side. And feel free to grab any of the URLs. We can put some in the chat as well if you wanna learn a little bit more about this project. Uh, but I would just like to play a little snippet of two pieces so you can get a sense of the type of uh, sonifications that I'm talking about. These are sort of bespoke creations that translate the various image data into sounds that hopefully are pleasing. And so this first piece I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play a short piece of the area around the supermassive black hole at the very central region of our Milky Way galaxy. This object is called Sagittarius A star, and it's sort of like the downtown area of our Milky Way. And we're gonna listen to three different telescopes with each being assigned to a different kind of sound as they sort of play together into this little symphony of an area of a black hole. And you'll hear as we approach the bright white blob on the lower right side, that symphony sort of starts to crescendo as we get closer and closer to that activity. And 
And the second piece I'll play is the Chandra Deep Field South. Now this image perhaps doesn't look super exciting or super spacey. It's kind of like a black rectangle with a bunch of multicolored confetti tossed onto it. But it's actually a really interesting field scientifically because it's essentially a spot in the universe that we observed for a long time where we found thousands of black holes. And so we've taken these images of black holes, all these little tiny dots, and we've assigned them to different kinds of sound based on their energy from low to high. And so what sort of looks perhaps like not the most exciting thing, I think actually sounds quite beautiful. So here we go. This scans from the bottom to the top. I'll stop there, but that's just a little snippet of those, all those black holes and the different kinds of energies that we can hear from them. So this project that we started in 2020 actually went completely viral, um, which was a very big surprise for me. We had over a million and a half listens on NASA SoundCloud within the first week and a half. Very significant news coverage, very high levels of engagement on social media, across YouTube channels, etc. It was the most popular feature on the Chandra website for 2020 and for a pretty good chunk of 2021. We conducted a research study to be able to follow up on this and how people were sort of looking at these different pieces and understanding them, or I should say listening to them and understanding them. And we had over 4,500 responses, which included one person who noted that it was the most fun survey I ever tipped. It was definitely a compliment. And we found that overall, there was really high learning and enjoyment levels, both for people who were sighted or for people who were blind or low vision. And then also surprisingly, that learning about how others access information, how others access information about our universe, um, there was a really significant um, check of that box as well for people who are sighted. And that I think was also a really nice thing to, to see. So, a lot of emotional responses were recorded from listening to these pieces from you know feeling peaceful or feeling relaxed to feeling calm or feeling curious and i think that was definitely helpful to see and understand particularly during um, the pandemic and perhaps that was part of such the huge response to it but there was still one piece missing to our sort of digital accessibility package if you will and that was that astronomy is such a visual field and we had sonifications of some of these images and uh, we had 3D prints of, of data sets that we could create 3D models from, but there was still a wealth of data that we did not have that accessibility component for. And so we partnered with some colleagues of mine, um, JJ Hunt and Christine Malek, to be able to create sort of bespoke visual descriptions of every single Chander image that's been released since January of 2021. So as it's released in real time to the public, we provide a detailed visual description of what that image is showing. And we use that information into like text and audio formats. They are linked into a podcast so people can listen to them. Um, we also use all that information as alternative text on our website, as metadata, as alt text on social media, et cetera. I won't go into the details of the technique, but we also have a paper on this. So if you'd like to learn more, I'd be happy to um, share that with you. Um, but essentially there are two key things and one is that it was really important to combine that scientific information with the visual description they had to be integrated in a sort of strategic way and two, the sort of grammar of it if you will we had to have um, numerous commas um, make sure we're, we're we're using the proper full nouns and not just saying things like it or the and really being specific with our language, um, paying attention to our sentence structure. And all that helps when people are sort of building their, their mental map of an image, particularly if they're using screen readers and the cadence that the screen readers will read at. Um, so we've been really happy to work on this project as well. I've got just an example on the screen on the Cat's Eye Nebula that I'll just read a short snippet from. Um, but the idea is to be very descriptive with this text and creative with how we describe it. And so there's one sentence I thought you all might like that says the dust cloud resembles the translucent pastry pulled to golden yellow points near our upper right and lower left with a blob of bright purple jelly inside the bulbous pale blue core. 
So there's this idea that taking an abstract or somewhat esoteric seeming image and being able to relate it back to things that people might be a little more familiar with has been a really helpful technique and also rather fun to work with. So this overall project has really been helping us inform not only what we're doing with our metadata, but also really how we approach and apply things to our other scientific writing for Chandra as well. And I'll just say, as I sum up that, you know, for me, we're sort of designing the universe here. We're taking all of this information from those ones and zeros, that original binary code and ramping it up into something like a data set. It doesn't have to be an image. It can be a sound. It can be something you touch. It's just this idea that the availability of data, just putting it out there, it does not equal an accessibility or an equity of access to that data. And so we're trying to pay particular attention to that. So I'll just sum up by saying thank you all for being here and a huge thanks to all of our teams that have been working on these projects with me, our visual description team, our sonification team, and our various 3D spatial and haptic teams as well. And yes, I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you so much. All right, give her a hand. She's not here to hear it, but we'll tell her about it. Um, that finishes our first session. Uh, obviously, Kim can't answer any questions because she's not here to answer such questions. If you type your questions in the uh, Slack chat, we'll make sure Kim sees them and that she answers them for you, okay? Uh, we now have our first 10 minute break. Uh, we are starting promptly at two, two o'clock, right? Matter of fact, be here 